Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Well, I'm unwinding, man. I am here in beautiful Florida and uh, doing a little bit of MLW wrestling, and it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. What can you complain about? Well, I agree, uh, but I did expect you to be uh, complaining a little bit today because this past weekend... Man, it was a roast and it was the roast of all wrestling roasts. We had lots of comedians on hand to poke fun at you. Of course, we need to thank Mr. James Mattern and Shuli Agar and uh, tons of other folks, but who could forget Ron Funches, Mike Lawrence, Taylor Williamson, and last but certainly not least, Dan St. Germain, who's got a new album coming out. No real winners here on 800 pound gorilla records. And you can actually get that at danstgermain.net and anywhere else you enjoy your albums, whether it's iTunes, Amazon, Pandora, Spotify, whatever. But man, these guys had a lot of fun poking fun at you. And maybe one of my, my most memorable jokes wasn't even a joke at you. So I, I want you to think about one of your favorite jokes from the roast, but mine, the one that I still remember to this day they're making fun of Jeff Jarrett and the line was the most memorable angle Jeff was ever in was Karen. Yeah, true that, you know, I'm still trying to figure out uh, how Jeff even got up on the panel because Jerry Jarrett didn't book it. Well, you know, and just, it, it goes on and on. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a roast of all ropes. They were mean to me, Conrad. They were, and we had a couple of surprise roasters. Mr. Jerry Lawler joined us. Of course, who could forget the Stooges, Pat Patterson, Jerry Briscoe. The list goes on and on. People were brutal to Brutus the fucking Barber Beefcake and Sean Waltman and Jeff Jarrett and Medusa. Uh, Man, it was a murderer's row of professional comedians making fun of professional wrestling and having some fun. You can check out the replays at fight.tv if you're into that. But I know what everybody's into is making sure that they return this country to greatness. That's easier than ever with ageless male max. They've got a patent pending formula with an ingredient that helps boost your total testosterone. And you're going to be able to, that's what it's all about. It is because here's the deal. They're going to go ahead and help you increase your muscle size and twice the reduction in body fat. than if you were to just go ahead and do exercise alone, you're also going to boost 64% of your nitric oxide. So that's going to come in handy no matter where you are, whether it's the gym or the bedroom, take your manhood to the max. Try this free. Can't believe that's real 30 day bottle. Just pay your shipping and handling. Now I want to reiterate. It's not 10 days. It's not 15 days. It's a full 30 day supply for free. And all you've got to do is text the word slam. That's S L A M to 79, 79, 79. And this is a formula that's going to boost your total testosterone. Get that free bottle right now. Text SLAM to 797979. That's S L A M to 797979. Of course, message and data rates may apply. Bruce, let's get into it, man. We've had a busy, busy week with all things StarCast, but this week we're doing something a little different. You know, we let the fans ask questions at StarCast uh, during the Monday Night War debate, and I thought, hey, that's kind of fun. I wish we had more time and I wish maybe we could just go more WWE. So what if we just let the fans ask the questions this week and you were into it. So we're going to let you guys take control of the show and we have got a ton. I'm talking about a ton of questions lined up for you, Bruce. We had an incredible response here. More than 700 replies on Twitter, more than 600 replies on Facebook. There's no way we can get through 1300 questions. We're going to tackle as many as we can here, and we'll get a lot more over on Patreon. So if you haven't already, check us out there at patreon.com forward slash something to wrestle. Bruce, are you ready? I am ready, but I got I to comment on one thing, Conrad. Do it. We, we, didn't, we didn't talk about the Monday Night Wars debate. And the whole Monday Night Wars debate, when Eric Bischoff and I were done debating the Monday night wars, we looked at each other and said, wow, we could have probably gone on for another two, three, four, five, six hours and not covered, you know, all of it still, because it was, it, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed debating my friend, Eric Bischoff. And we, you know, we have different points of view on 
what took place in the Monday Night Wars, and we got them all out. And thanks to all of the people that were there, you know, we had a couple of nice little sellouts with everybody coming to the Monday Night Wars and the roast, and that was crazy in and of itself. So it was a blast. So we've got lots of questions here that I want to ask, but one of them is something that we get all the time from a really small group of fans, but man, they ask over and over and over and I've never asked. So I'm just going to tap out here. I'm going to give in both Brian Fury and Rick Hayes want to know why did creative quote unquote, have nothing for Steve Bradley. So what's the question? Why did creative have nothing for Steve Bradley? We, we try, we tried different things with him, but you know, Steve was one of those guys that was a hell of a technician. He was good in the ring. He was actually a pretty good teacher as well, but he just didn't have a whole lot of personality. Rob wants to know, what are your recollections of when Vince showed up at the long Island house show where he stopped the rhino to Jerry match? <laughs> Oh my God, he was pissed. And it, it was from time to time, we would obviously in New York markets, we were always at the live events. So, you know, from time to time, we, we would sit there and Vince just got so pissed off because he felt that the guys were just walking through the match and going through the motions. And they weren't telling any kind of story. It was kind of typical, what I like to call typical indie house show wrestling bullshit. And Vince felt, you know, here we are, we're in New York, we're in his backyard, and this match sucked. So Vince did what I think so many of us have wanted to do over the years. He walked to the ring, stopped the match, and told both guys to get the hell out of his ring. They didn't deserve to be in the ring. And when they came back, chewed their ass out for having a horrible match. But it was just a, a, a matter of frustration, and it was not just to Rhino and to Tajiri, but it was to the entire locker room. Get off your ass. Stop, you know, walking through your matches and, and, oh, we'll just do the same thing we did last night. Go out and entertain the live house. And that, that was his message to everybody. Uh, Joseph wants to know out of, uh, some of the more well-known ECW icons, which of these guys does Bruce think did the best for WWE and who did the worst Raven Sandman dreamer and Sabu. Um, I th probably would have to give the nod to Dreamer just because he, he was there the longest and he held behind the scenes as well. Out of, out of all those guys, probably the one I had the most fun with was Sandman just because he was he wasn't drinking. He was straight as an arrow and, and he's a extremely intelligent guy. And he, during that time, I just had fun with him. Here's a fun one. I've always wanted to know who was behind the push of Barry Horowitz in 95 when he beat Skip. <laughs> that was, you know, we, we were sitting around the table and it was really Pat Patterson, um, but sitting around the table and, and thinking about some different things to help get Skip over and, and do something different, not predictable. Uh, Pat said, it was, what if, what if Horowitz beat him? It could give, you know, it could give, Skip something to sink his teeth into for a little while. Barry Horowitz was on TV and probably a lot more well known than Skip was at the time, and gave him some personality. He gave him something to sink his teeth into a little while and give him a little TV push. Here's a fun one. Um, and I don't know why this comes up as often or, or doesn't come up more often. DJ Lewis wants to know, we've heard about what physical assets the WWE got from the WCW purchase, but what came with the purchase of ECW? The tape library, mainly. That was about it. Uh, you know, there were, um, we might've taken some of their rings. I don't even know that they had a lot of rings. I think s some of that stuff was sold off to pay some of their debt, but, uh, physically, I don't think that there was a whole lot to take. Here's a fun introspective question. Jason wants to know what would Vince say is Bruce's biggest contribution to the business or the WWE during his career? A different outlook. And, and a, as funny as, as it sounds, you know, we were talking about it just the other day and especially in from 2001 in the last few years was I had the ability to get outside of the bubble 
and I lived outside of the bubble and not being in the office every day and being in Stanford every day allowed me to give a different perspective than those who were there every day in and out and their only world was the WWE. Um, in later years, that, that's one thing that I, I brought that I didn't even realize I was bringing because I was talking to real people every day. I was speaking to fans that were um, on an airplane or, or what have you at the rental car, at the hotel, different places that I got their viewpoint on things that they wouldn't give if they knew, first of all, who the hell I was or in Stanford, I guess is the best way to, to put it. Um, but overall, I just think that, uh, some of the characters I've created are still there and still going strong with Undertaker and Kane and, you know, John Cena, just some of those, Hey, my guys are getting older, but (laughs) you know, it was a good run. Here's a fun one for you. Uh, Celso wants to know who came up with the idea of a Puerto Rican pay-per-view in 05. Why was it the first and last pay-per-view there? Uh, boy, I don't even remember. I think that it was something to do that was different and allowed us to get out of the norm and come from a different location than what people were used to. Uh, how much would, this is from Corey, how much would the Monday night wars have been affected had Bischoff gotten Pat Patterson to jump ship? Now I know we're jumping in our, what if machine scenario here, but hypothetically, if Pat jumped ship, which is something that not a lot of people talk about, if Pat jumped, does that change anything? See, I don't know that it does because, you know, Pat's forte, uh, creative wise, it worked with the WWE. And I don't know that, that Eric in that time frame would have been as receptive to that. I'm not sure that that's where Eric's head was. Gavin, so I think to- it would have changed things. Gavin wants to know, would you have changed anything that was booked? Had you not been fired in 91, 92? So a little armchair quarterback action. If you had to go back and take a look at what went down in 91, 92, is there something that you were just like, Oh, I wouldn't have done that. Oh boy. You know, I, I probably, well, I wouldn't have brought lawyer back. (laughs) That kind of goes without saying. And I, I think that at the time. I, I would have pushed again. This is a, this is what if. So in a perfect world, I probably would have pushed for Hogan to be a heel at uh, WrestleMania Eight with Sid. I think that Sid was the baby face that they wanted at the time, and they really wanted you know that Hulk heel character. Here's a fun one. <laughs> we never talked about this. Chris Young wants to know, how was it seeing Bruno Lauer at Raw 25th anniversary after he ripped into you in his new book? It was great. It was, you know, it was fine. And look, man, you know, through the years you deal with people and how you deal with people. I was young and, and different things and probably didn't treat Bruno all that great all the time. A lot of his stories and remembrances were inaccurate, um, but they're his. So that's how he remembered it. And if that's how he remembered it, then that's how it is in, in his recollection. So you can go, okay, hey, I'm sorry, and you move on from there. But none of that stuff hurts me because we're all in a place in time and you react to certain things based on what you're dealing with at that time. And nobody's perfect. Uh, I've apologized to Bruno, you know, time and time. I say, hey, if I treated you wrong in the past, man, I apologize. And, and you try to make it right, move forward from it. But a lot of it was, again, you write the book and it is what it is, but it was great seeing him actually. And I've seen him a lot before that as well. Steven wants to know, did Bruce ever push for a guy that turned out to be a bust or completely underwhelming? Um, Taka Michinoku. Taka, but I don't know that Taka was a, was a huge bust as much as, he just, well, you know, the light heavyweight division really didn't take off the way that anybody wanted it to. And God, but there, you know, there's probably a, a lot of them. You, everybody can go back to the, the time that I suggested uh, roadkill to come in and be a completely, not to be roadkill, but to be a completely different character and come in and work a program, just a one-off with The Undertaker. Um, it's funny how people who weren't there and never heard the pitch and didn't hear 
the entire story, how they frame that. Oh, my God, Bruce Pritchard wanted to bring in Roadkill to work with Undertaker at WrestleMania. It wasn't exactly the pitch. And um, But at the same time, when Roadkill came up and it was time to to perform and show everybody that he could do it, he he didn't do it. He couldn't do it. And he, he couldn't keep up. And Vince was impressed. So loved the look. Loved the idea behind it. But when the bell rang, unfortunately, it wasn't there. Uh, here's a, here's a fun one. And I don't know why this has not been discussed before. What's an example of something Bruce thought was a bad idea that ended up being a good idea. Um, ultimate warrior, <laughs> um, God, uh, again, that's probably, probably a lot of them. You know, I didn't, I wasn't a big fan of, Okay, everybody, here here you go, folks. I wasn't a big fan of putting the title on Triple H when I put the title on Triple H originally. I wasn't a big fan of a lot of the stuff in the beginning of the Attitude Era when it, it just got to the point of no sense to me. Um, but yet, you know, hey, it worked, and it got over. So uh, chat me up. Because this is a fun question and I, I don't even know that you've seen it. So you've probably at least heard about it. Sloop wants to know, can Bruce let us know what it might've sounded like when Jim Cornette saw Joey Ryan's entrance at all in. Uh, you know what? I, what the fuck motherfuckers walk a goddamn dick, son of a bitch. I, I didn't see it, so I'm sorry. I can't do it justice. Uh, I'm sure that you heard about if it. it had, if it had anything to do with penises, then Corny might be a little. So you, okay, so you don't know what happened. No, sir, I don't. Okay, what so happened? so here's the deal. In storyline on Being the Elite, a wrestler named Hangman Page. Have you seen him yet? I've seen him, yeah. I've you, met him you, okay, last weekend. You, you're going to love his work. He murdered, with his cowboy boots, Joey Ryan. So Joey Ryan's dead. And after he won his match, Hangman Page, all the lights go out. And instead of druids coming down, like for The Undertaker, 10 men in penis costumes, full bodysuit penis costumes came down. And the ghost of Joey Ryan was resurrected. And he came back to life, much like The Undertaker. And as he walked past the dick druids, or as someone in the box called them, the fluids, the penises went from flaccid to fully erect. And then he ran into the ring and they did the big dick bump spot. So hypothetically, what do you think Cornette's going to think of that spot? What the fuck? Same thing I do. What the fuck motherfuckers? That's the silliest, stupidest shit I've ever seen in my life. But in fairness, is it that different than when the undertaker comes back to life? No, it's not even close. I love you for that. Well, maybe what they could have done at the end of the day was just sent Joey Ryan to heaven, like Undertaker at Royal Rumble, right? Didn't send him to heaven. No, because he'd go to hell. Because that's where he all the bad. Oh, sorry. So he here's a fun one. Cody wants to know, and you better not say Roman Reigns. Come up with a different one. Who does Bruce believe could be the guy in the WWE within the next five years? I don't think he means someone on the main roster. I think he means someone who's not, who we're not seeing on Mondays or Tuesdays right now. Matt Riddle. That's who I thought she would say. I mean, it, it really, if you have a different answer, I don't know what to say. I mean, that's gotta be the answer. Yeah. Matt Riddle, Matt Riddle's going to set that place on fire. Matt Riddle's somebody that for whatever reason, he's got um, it. He, he does have it and he gets it. Plus he's a tough son of a bitch. Here's a fun one. Uh, Tony Barker wants to know every time earthquake walked to the ring, the cameraman would pan down to his feet and then back up to his face. How did that come about? It makes him look bigger when you shoot him from the, from a lower angle. You know, the other thing that you didn't notice that that happened every time earthquake came to the ring is the camera shook every time an earthquake took a step. James wants to know what is Vince McMahon's general reaction to a superstar pooping themselves in a match? Specifically, what did he say to Stone Cold after he pooped himself from a Yokozuna body slam? Well, I don't know that he knew that Steve pooped himself during a Yokozuna body slam. 
time, but if you can see it, it's usually <laughs> that's usually the usual reaction, pretty much. Ah, he poopy pants. He took the poop in his pants, right in his pants. He pooped. Jacob Green wants to know any stories about Mike McGurk. I always thought she was a good ring announcer, but it seems like she's forgotten about. Well, Mike, you know, went and she raised her family there in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and she kind of retired from traveling and ring announcing as her kids got older. But Mike was the daughter of the famous wrestling wrestler and wrestling promoter in Louisiana and, and Oklahoma area, Leroy McGurk. And Leroy was a great junior heavyweight back in the day. And then he was the promoter for the original mid South area that Bill Watts, um, acquired, let's put it that way. Uh, many years later, Jeff wants to know, was there ever any mention of Rick Martell in the hall of fame and why didn't he make it? You know, Rick is going to make it. Rick's name was something that was brought up, uh, several times. And for whatever reason, Vince would always feel that it was too soon for Rick and that, you know, Rick's got, Rick's maybe got another one left in him. Now I'm going back what, 15 years, what have you. So I think that that has kind of passed, passed by because good God, Rick's got to be 60 plus right now. And, um, he'll be in, Rick will get in eventually. Bob wants, Bob wants to know one of Vince's favorites. Bob wants to know any memories of the summer tent show tours. The, Oh God. Uh, yes. And there was, there was a guy that used to run the summer, summer tent shows. And he was, a he was a biker. Um, God, I can't remember his name. It's on the tip of my tongue, but he had a big old beard and he was a, a biker and it was a part of a motorcycle club that would come in. They were the nicest guys in the world. It wasn't the hell's angels or anybody like that. It was a Northeastern group, but it was kind of through the smaller towns of Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, sometimes we'd go into New York, Pennsylvania, but it was an East Coast deal that during the summer they would run all of these like parks, I guess is the best way to do it. But they were smaller venues and they were, they were tent shows. We would put the 16 foot ring in the arena and have just small house shows. And it would usually be, you would have a main event, you'd have a semifinal, and then you would have two single matches underneath that and a tag team from those two single matches will come back and have a tag team match, uh, right before the main event. So they were a lot of fun. Greg Sirota wants to know, why do you think Vince refuses to switch to the metal cable ring ropes, which most wrestlers seem to prefer? Well, most wrestlers don't really seem to prefer it. Uh, if, if you've never been exposed to the cables, then obviously if your first exposure is with ropes guys prefer the ropes they prefer what they're used to and it's he thinks that the rope looks better and it just looks more professional than the than the cables but again guys that were only brought up on rope they swear by rope guys that were brought up on cable swear by cable mark wants to know who builds the rings a lot of people uh there were, the funny thing is there was, uh, guys that used to build them and put them together. You usually try and find a welder and get plans in the 19, late 1970s, 1980s. I remember in Texas that they started building them lighter. And what I mean by that is that there was a lot less steel used in it and it was a lot more wood and they, it was just a lighter material. Sometimes they'd use aluminum in certain parts of it, but enough to make it sturdy. And you had a lot of ring builders for WWE. And when I got there, man, they had the damn thing reinforced underneath with a big spring in the middle of it that had, I swear to God, you could, you could crash in an 18 wheeler off of a 50 foot bridge. And that bump would be easier and softer than taking a bump in the WWE rings back in the day. And then, uh, lo and behold, then started taking bumps in there and the ring changed. So we introduced him to why Southern rings are, uh, made a little bit better and they give more and they're more forgiving on a competitor's body. 
So there's a lot of people all over the country, but but I you know right now I think that the rings that uh, WWE has, the rings that Ring of Honor has, uh, I think are some pretty good rings. I think a lot of those are made by uh, high spots too, or they at least contribute and manufacture a lot of the soft goods, I believe. Yeah, and, and Danny Davis uh, may is I think has made the last the last few ROH rings uh, out of out of Kentucky. Arturo wants to know, are there any finishers or commonly used moves in WWE that Bruce thinks are not safe? Yeah, a lot of them. I don't like anything that you get close to being dropped on your head or your neck. Um, uh, there were, there were different things like, uh, I wouldn't have wanted to take Christian's finish back in the day. I wouldn't have taken the razor's edge or the, uh, the big power bomb that diesel does jackknife. Yeah, jackknife. Just certain things I wouldn't take. Late to the Nitro Party has a follow up question about that. If Bruce had to take a traditional pile driver, who would he trust the most to give him the move? Undertaker, Jerry Lawler. I thought you might say that. Uh, Oglesby Machining wants to know My question is what happened with you guys and Matt Coon? I heard him buried on the show recently and never got an explanation. What happened with it? Nothing happened with us and Matt Coon. Matt Coon's off doing whatever it is that he's doing. And uh, Matt didn't want to be associated with the show anymore. So uh, wish him wish him very well. But uh, yeah. I guess we should expound on that. What Matt did was put together our show in post-production. Now Joseph Feeney does that. You probably know him as JoJo from Keeping It 100. Uh, Matt decided he wanted to try his hand at podcasting and actually being on the mic instead of just editing it together and He's doing that now with a handful of shows, uh, Dutch Mantel and Johnny Fairplay and Robbie E all the big stars. Yeah. Uh, DJ Lewis wants to know why was Matt Hardy and Mark Henry at SummerSlam 08 so short? These are the questions we need answers to. <laughs> um, did you really want that match to be longer? I want you, I want you to ask yourself inside, deep inside. Do you really want that match longer? And then come back to me. Uh, Danny wants to know, do you feel the success of all in has helped change the wrestling industry? Well, I don't know if it, it changed. You know, I don't know what you want to change about the wrestling industry. Do, do I think that it opened a lot of people's eyes and said, Hey, there's something else out there and gives people a choice. Yes, I do. And I think that's good for the business. And I think it makes everybody point to the business and say it's healthy and more opportunity for people to make money. And I'm all for that. Daryl wants to know what's a name that would surprise fans as someone who was discussed for a title run. I mean, you've talked about this on the show before and he said, Tito Santana, let's forget, let's forget for a minute that that was a name you mentioned. Do you have another one? Hmm. That would shock people. Um, well, I think that sometimes when Vince would look at some, I'm Ed Johnson was somebody that we talked about at one point. But, you know, these are things that you talk about in your what-if moments. Uh, Johnny Bad was somebody, you know, until he came and our bell rang, uh, was somebody we talked about. God, you know, could you imagine him as WWF champion? So those are, you know, Ahmed and Johnny B. Bad would probably be the, the two big ones. Um, it's funny, some of the people that think that they should have been there, like Dusty, you know, Dusty sometimes, you know, maybe if I could only get the championship, you know, have a little run. And by the time Dusty got to us, it was, man, entertain us and and, and play that role and, and be Dusty. Um, he didn't, that, and again, it was your shit. He didn't need it. He didn't need it at all. He was Dusty Rhodes. He was bigger than that. But, but Hulk Hogan needed it, right? Hulk did in the beginning, yes. I don't think Hulk needed it later in his career at all. But Hulk was always identified as the champion. Dusty was always identified as the challenger. No, that's Dusty a, that's was better accurate. at chasing than yes. he was as the champion. There you go. Jose wants to know, why does Bruce walk around hotel lobbies barefoot? I stayed down the hall from him at StarCast, and it made me do a double take. What? Apparently you're a barefoot walker in public places. 
No, I just I walked down I walked down to your place one time barefoot. Right. But we were I mean it was just down the hall. I don't <laughs> My God. I love your defending. Uh, I didn't it. walk around the hotel lobby and go to the. I heard you went to the bathroom. The barefoot. I, I heard you went work. to the bathroom barefoot. That's what I heard. I went to the barefoot bathroom. You went to the, to the uh, bathroom barefoot and Michael Hayes peed on your feet and you just kept moving. Yeah. No, sorry. I went to Conrad's room barefoot. What'd you do in there? <laughs> you know. <laughs> um uh -huh. horror movie barbecue wants to know any reason as to why corporal kirshner was advertised for the gimmick battle royal and then removed a few days later i don't remember and i remember you know originally contacting him and wanting him to come in i don't know if it was a japanese tour or what the hell happened but at the last minute he backed out no one wants to know, what do you think of what Chris Jericho is doing in new Japan? You know, what I've seen with Chris, Chris continues to reinvent himself and man, more power to him. <laughs> if you can go from place to place and, and stay on top and plug everything else that you have going on, man, God bless you. And I think that Jericho is probably one of the best true heels left in the business. Um, tremendous worker. And I enjoy the hell out of watching his stuff because he constant he doesn't rest on his laurels. And he doesn't just do the same old shit over and over. Uh, here's a good one. Jake wants to know, was the name Simon Dean used as a rib on Dean Malenko since his real name is Dean Simon. As a matter of fact, I believe someone, someone did come up with that. And I don't think, <laughs> I don't think Vince even realized it at the time. I like it. Simon Dean, that's a good, strong name. Did you know that there was now an Indiana doink and is it a rib? Oh my, no, I did not know that. And Might be a tribute. Haven't we had enough doinks in this business? Uh, personally, I prefer the says, what is the one wrestling impression that no matter how hard you try, you just can't master? God, there's probably a bunch of them. I don't know. Who is it, Conrad? Who, do, who can I do? I don't know. Sometimes you're Ric Flair and your Hunter are the same person. Yes, they are. They just kind of with the lift and go down. And then, but Hunter is more like, I don't know, man. Hunter's kind of way down here. But Rick is with the lift a little bit. Yes, sir. I think it's her. I don't do a good Ric Flair. Jay Lethal uh, does a great Ric Flair. Jay Lethal, I think, is the world's best at Ric Flair and Macho Man. Just outstanding. Yeah, I don't I don't think that, that anybody has, has ever laughed as hard as uh, the time that we got Jay lethal to do Ric Flair to Ric Flair, and then actually got it on the air in TNA. Chris wants to know in honor of Conrad's story from 83 weeks about selling a Ric Flair robe. What's the one piece of wrestling memorabilia that Bruce Pritchard would never sell under any circumstance? Um, I don't think I would sell Maurice, uh, the French angels death mask. I don't think I would sell that. I would never sell Kane's original mask. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, I, it, that stuff doesn't mean a whole lot to me, but the 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 death mask does, and Kane's first mask does. Matt wants to know, Bruce, were you ever summoned to wrestler's court as a defendant? No, I was not. He also wants to know, was there ever a son of the Undertaker angle pitched? No son of the Undertaker. We got everybody else in his family involved. <laughs> but no, because the undertaker is ageless. He just wouldn't, he, he's forever young. Uh, I do want to mention that you recently rode in a cab with the undertaker's son. Do you want to share that story? Good God. Okay. So I'm in New Rochelle, New York, and I'm, I'm heading in to New York city for a lunch or a dinner. And the guy comes and picks me up and on the way, he's probably listening to this right now too, man. So next time I'm in New York, he'll probably look me up and come and kill me or something. But, uh, is we're, we're writing in, he didn't know who I was or, or what I did. We were talking about podcasts and different things. I told him about this really great podcast called something to wrestle with Bruce Richard. And uh, he said he was going to check it out. Um, but he said, he goes, yeah, I'm kind of connected to the wrestling business. I said, really? How's that? He says, well, my, my real dad is the undertaker. 
And um, <sighs> I'm looking, and the guy was celebrating his 24th birthday coming up. Now, I know The Undertaker pretty well, <laughs> personally. And I'm aware of all the children that he's had and, and what have you. And the guy goes on to explain that uh, his mother back in the day of Andy Warhol and Studio 54, but in the glory days of Studio 54, that Undertaker used to hang out there all the time, and his mom used to work there, and that the Undertaker uh, got his mother pregnant, and they had the baby out of wedlock and, and what have you. Um, and then he goes on to tell me that the reason that he knows this is true is because his dad, okay, you know, a minute ago he told me Undertaker was his dad, but his dad, the guy that raised him as his dad, is best friends with Undertaker's brother, Kane. <laughs> and that, that Kane and Undertaker don't really get along and they don't they don't speak. They haven't for years. And and it goes it goes back to, you know, like early, early times and how. And as a kid, they just didn't really get along in real life. And I'm looking at him, I'm going, is that right? No shit, man. And now the whole time I am texting the Undertaker. The real Undertaker, <laughs> and I'm going, hey bro, uh, I'm in an Uber in New York City. Oh yeah, where are you going? To dinner. By the way, your son is the driver. <laughs> and he's like, what? So we go back and forth, and I'm telling him all. I'm 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 basically just texting as this kid's telling me the story. And I I guess I I kind of left out that um, <laughs> this guy. <laughs> This guy could double for Mark Henry's brother, but there were very few similarities to The Undertaker, if you get my drift. He's a black guy, and he says that The Undertaker was his dad. Yes. Yeah. So how amazing is that? But that, but it was way back in like from the 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 seventies and eighties when they met. But he's only twenty four years old. <laughs> And it was like absolutely nothing matched up. And I just had a good time with him, listen to him, because he was a nice guy. He was a good Uber driver. And he said he was going to listen to my podcast, so I indulged. But, yeah, I'm just tickled. I was able to entertain The Undertaker for a little while on a drive into Manhattan. Jeff wants to know, what was the process like for picking Pyro for a guy's entrance? Were there preset packages, or did you come up with the ideas, and then the tech guys figured out how to do it? Usually we'd give a character to TV and they would work with, you know, whatever the entrance video was. And we'd leave it to the pyro guys to try and come up with something creative that would accentuate what they did. Sometimes we'd say, hey, wouldn't it be cool like gold dust? Wouldn't it be cool if this shower of, of gold came down and um, just different things like that. But mostly we would leave it to the experts to come up with something that would enhance the entrance. I know we've talked about this before, but we get tons of questions. So we're going to circle back to it. Craig Houston wants to know, did Bruce ever meet Vince's brother, Rod? And did they ever try to bring him in for an angle minus the Benoit tragedy explosion, that whole timeline. Do you remember anything with Vince's brother, Rod? I knew Rod before I knew Vince. Uh, Rod lives in Houston, Texas, and I got a phone call one day at the office in Houston when I was working there. This had to be 1985, maybe 1986, and he explained who he was. He wanted to come to the matches and wanted to know if uh, he could get some tickets. And I said, by all means, come on down, and he came down, introduced himself, met Paul, and really, really nice guy, uh, nice family, and so on and so forth. And I remember when I met Vince for the first time, I said, yeah, and I met your brother, as a matter of fact. God damn, how the hell do you know Rod? And, but no, there was Rod had no desire whatsoever to be in the business. And, and for a long time, I don't know how close Vince and Rod were way back when, but uh, they're very close now. And it's, he's, he's a great guy, man. He's, he's a cool cat. I don't think the internet will ever get enough about Rod. Uh, Matthew wants to know what would Bruce say is his greatest achievement in wrestling as a performer, as an agent, what role did you enjoy the most? And where do you think you were uh, able to make the most impact? 
I think as far as working behind the scenes and, and creating and producing, that, that's my love because you get to be every character, not just not just play one. You get to play them all. So I love creating for other talent. I love, love working with young talent. And I think as, as far as a producer, that's what I enjoyed the most. You know, I always loved performing as Brother Love, but the, the true love and what I enjoyed most was producing young talent. Admiral wants to know in the time of Al Venus and Godfather, were there ever any other sexually charged characters slash gimmicks slash storylines that never materialized because they were deemed too risque or offensive? Thank God. No, isn't that enough? That probably is. Here's another fun one, you know, and, and we've gotten different variations of this, but they all sort of want to know, and this one's from Brian. Has anyone heard anything about the new Vince McMahon biopic film and who should play Bruce? <laughs> oh my God. You know, the old days I would have said, uh, what was Philip Seymour Hall? He died. Is that, is that the right name? No. What's his name? Hey, I want you to try it one more time just cause it's fun. Uh, do I have any of the names right? <laughs> you got one of them. Which one? Seymour? Okay, you got two of them. Phil Seymour Thomas? Hoffman. Hoffman, whatever. Yeah, but that no, that guy that guy could have done it for sure. That's the one that ever that's the name that everybody would always say to me all the time. What about could, what about Fat Val Kilmer? <laughs> um that's fucked up, man. No, I mean, not when he's like, they would have to play me while I'm young. Fat Val Kilmer's old, but you're old. Well, that, but I'm not there now. So the, the, the Vince biopic would have to be when I was younger. I think... have to be a strapping, good looking young man. No, I don't, I don't know that you were ever that, but I am. You were. Yes. You think See? told you <laughs> Tim wants to know, did the WWE ever consider the great Muda? Uh, you know what? Pat Patterson and I went to a NWA show in New Haven. Where, where were we? New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, and, <laughs> and we actually tried to talk to Muda. Muda didn't speak much uh, Japanese, I mean, uh, much English. And Gary Hart saw us talking to him and immediately came running over and, and pulled Muda away. There was some interest in Muda, but his lack of communication skills is, is what the big deterrent was. Chris wants to know what big time celebrity surprised you the most of being a wrestling fan. Hmm. Um, what's the guy's name? I always tell you about judge, uh, Judd, uh, Judd Nelson, Judd Apatow. No, Judd Apatow's a big wrestling fan too, but, uh, the guy that was in breakfast club. Oh yeah. That's Judd Nelson. Yeah. Um, he was a big fan and I, I was sitting, sitting in a bar one night and he sat there and told me everything about myself. And I just was like, really? <laughs> I just, I don't know. Some people just catch you off guard a little bit, but, uh, Rob Reiner, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of them. It, it's, it's a guilty pleasure for them and something that they really appreciate. Well, I wouldn't have bet on that, but I'll tell you what, if you're looking for some advice, you should do what we do and go bet with my bookie. Trust me, guys, they're your best bet this season. They've been in, in business for years. They've got a ton of great reviews online and their mobile site is super easy to use. Not to mention they even have in-game live betting and the most rewarding player perks in the business. Plus for all you fantasy guys out there, you can even bet the over under on how many fantasy points a player will score each game. Where else can you do that? So go lay down some cash and win big today. You win, they pay. Join now and my bookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar. What are you waiting for? Use this promo code wrestle. That's wrestle when creating your account and claim up to a thousand dollars in free play. You hear me up to a thousand dollars. That's my bookie, M Y B O O K I E. And don't forget to use that promo code wrestle when creating your account to claim the bonus. Let's recap. You play, you win, you get paid. You got to check out my bookie. It's what Bruce and I are doing this weekend for the NFL and you should too.
So let's keep the party rolling here, man. We've got tons more questions to get to. Uh, Chris wants to know, is Kurt Angle, Bret Hart, the best feud slash match we never saw? That would have been a great one for damn sure, because uh, I think there was a lot of mutual respect there. They would have tore the house down every friggin' night. That would have been a great one. Chris says, per Bruce, the WWF took care of Patera's family financially when he was in prison. However, Ken claims the money was later taken out of his paychecks. What's true? Well, I don't know what happened later on, but I know while Ken was in prison, he was he was taken care of by Vince, or his, his wife was taken care of. So I don't know about any of that afterwards. Uh, here's a fun one here. <laughs> Andrew WR was Matt Hardy version one's dislike for mustard a shoot. Oh, hell yes. Where do you think we, those facts came from? You think we just make shit up? You know, one of the things that we've talked about a lot here on the show is that the undertaker is like deathly afraid of cucumbers and just hates them. But one of the things we've never talked about here, as far as I know, is that you are deathly afraid of pickles. I'm not afraid of them. I don't like them. No, but I mean, it's like a whole thing. Do you want to take us through some of your, uh, your pickle endeavors? I don't like pickles. I don't like people to think about pickles when they make my food. Um, I don't like pickles. And and I got to tell you what, uh, someone who I thought was my friend (laughs) did me one time, you know, I had, I just recovered from a a massive heart attack and I went to their home to, (laughs) to try and relax and to try and, and get everything back. Right. And I, I arrived at their, their place. And late. I have a, it was like the middle of the night. Late. Your plane was yeah. delayed. All the cabs yeah. were gone. There was no Uber. You had to rent a car with a stranger and creep in in the middle of the night. Yeah. And, uh, when I got to my, to my wing in the house, um, I was greeted with pickles. I was greeted with a stuffed pickle. I was greeted with jars of pickles. I was greeted with pickle chips. Uh, there were um, actual pickles out of the jar, which I don't understand <laughs> at all, um, all over the place in, in my room and in my bathroom. There was even there was even a giant dill pickle in the toilet. <laughs> now, to take it one step further... Um, because my friends, they all have elevators in their homes. Seriously, all my friends do. Um, the next day, when I when I got back to the house to just just try and relax, there were blown up giant pickles in the elevator, making it almost impossible for me to ride up to my to my wing of the house. Allegedly, there were um, pickles out of the jar in the sheets, and there were pickle shaped yep. pillows. And pickles in the shower and yeah. pickle toothpaste and pickle pens and pickle juice. Oh, yeah, pickle pens, yeah. 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 It was all destroyed. And and this, this phobia came about because once you're at a barbecue restaurant and they always just put sauce and pickles there and your pickles touched your food and you freaked out and threw a conniption fit. Yeah, I don't like pickles, man. So uh hopefully you're what listening. Don't you like? Hopefully you're listening. You know what I hate? Can I just be honest with you? It's just me and you yeah. talking. Just me and you. I hate, uh, I hate chocolate covered Oreos. That's not true. Conrad. Now you're lying. <laughs> I'm scared of them. Yep. It's just not true. I got this fat by you being scared of them. <laughs> well, I mean, listen, two years ago, I would have said, oh, I hate blonde haired ladies. I hate them. Well, you know, now I'm just, I'm on cookies and shit. Uh, Chris wants to know, did I hear Bruce correctly during his table for three with JBL and Bischoff that Vince thought of a network in the eighties? If so, is this why Vince wanted to buy up all the smaller companies? Yeah. First time I ever heard about it was in the eighties. And again, you know, what we thought of as a network at that time was you're thinking of a USA network. You're thinking of a cable channel. And that's what you think of as a network because in the 80s, we didn't have computers. There was no internet, guys. 
it didn't exist. So there was no such thing as a streaming service. And that was, you know, as time goes on, your ideas evolve to fit the, <laughs> the time in which you're currently in. So the network had many different formations as time went on. But yeah, back in the 80s, I remember Vince talking about having his own network. And we would have a 24-7, you know, network. It's come to full fruition. We looked at it differently back then, but. Brandon wants to know, what's Bruce's opinion on the Pentagon Jr. gimmick with rumors of him maybe going to the WWE? Do you think he could succeed even though allegedly he speaks no English? Yeah, right. Um, first of all, I'm a big fan of Pentagon. Secondly, he does well, speak English. Secondly, yeah, he speaks English when it's convenient to speak English. And um, I think he's a talented son of a gun, man. I really do. I think that he would, I really think he, he would do well there. But he would have to change, he would have to change a lot of things about the way that he works. As far as he works, he works for a house show. He works for a crowd versus television. And I think he's smart enough to do it because he's a talented guy. So um, if they get him, good for them. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, chat me up. This is a fun one here. Randy Turco wants to know the undertaker's hook. He wore every day during his American badass and big evil days. What does it mean? And he included a picture where around like the front left belt loop. Sure enough. There's like a clip, almost like a riggers clip where you would keep your keys or a cable or whatever. Any idea what the fuck that was about? I have no idea what you're talking about. Man, it may that, have just been something on his outfit. There's just, that's so inside, but you know, those little weird details. Sometimes you have something on, uh, William Never. wants to know, in your opinion, does Missy Hyatt belong in the hall of fame? You know, I don't know that Missy was, was around any big companies enough to really warrant it. But if you go back as far as like those beautiful divas and then the uh, valets, Missy was one of the originals and she was red hot in her time. But I don't know if she's Hall of Fame worthy. One of the unsung heroes here, Nathan, wants to know who threw those beers to Stone Cold and how did they get so good at it? Mark Keaton, lots of practice. Great question here because I was faced with this situation a few years ago and I just guessed hypothetically, if I scored a job in the office at WWE and came into contact with the talent, would I be calling him Mr. Undertaker, Mark, or Mr. Calloway? What's the protocol on using a wrestler's ring name when you meet them in real life? Depends on where you are and what the situation is. Let's say you're at I the mean, hotel bar and the performer known as the undertaker walks in and sits down at the stool next to you. Name's taker. All right. Let's say you're at the grocery store. Still taker. <laughs> <Let's know. laughs> when is he not when he's dropping his kids off at daycare? Even then he's taker. When is he not? Uh, well, you gotta be, I, I don't know. I, I just think it depends on how, you know, people, where, you know, them in what context, um, he, you know, he's a friend of mine, but I still call him taker pretty much. But see, as a friend, you're calling him taker. We should call him Mr. Undertaker. Yes. Yes. Mr. Undertaker. Yeah. Not, not taker takers for his friends. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me on that because by God, don't call him taker. I know. Mr. I heard, I heard Mr. Some, Undertaker. I heard First somebody name under, last name Taker. Read the boots, bitch. Do, do, yeah. do. I heard I heard somebody refer to him as Taker once in your presence. And he said, Oh, y'all are on that level now. You just call him Taker. And they crawled under the couch. So I uh I knew that rule. Yeah. Um Bart wants to know what would Vince McMahon and Ed Russo or uh, Ed Ferrara and Vince Russo have thought of Joey Ryan's gimmick during the attitude era. I think that's a great idea. I mean, it feels like something Russo could have come up with even for Val Venus, right? The Dick flip. I, I think Russo would have loved it. And I think Vince McMahon looked too far, pal. There were even, there were even some things that Vince wouldn't do, but I think Russo would have loved it. 
Uh, RT trends 99 wants to know what was the idea behind diesel's 358 day reign? What was Vince's fascination with diesel? God damn. Look at him. He's huge. You know, uh, I think that Vince probably had more of a fascination with Kevin Nash than diesel. Kevin's a, you know, a charming guy. He's funny and makes you laugh. And I think that Vince kind of fell in love with Kevin Nash, but the, the audience, and here's another thing that I always get in arguments with people about the audience wanted diesel. They didn't want Kevin Nash. They wanted diesel and the audience turned diesel baby face. But when we made the decision to turn him baby face in storyline and, and creatively, we fucked it up by, in, in one fell swoop, I'll never forget it. I'm sitting there and, and they do this interview. And one of my biggest pet peeves, and you know, JR and I will get in arguments about this all the time, so it's nothing new. Don't everybody go and fucking tweet him. But I didn't give a shit about some guy's collegiate football career. I didn't give a shit somebody was an All-American in some other sport when you're telling me a story about who this character is in the wrestling ring. And all of a sudden, JR's doing an interview with Kevin Nash and talking about his basketball career in, in Tennessee. I'm thinking, they don't, they don't care about that guy. They care about the big monster diesel that's kicking everybody's ass, who's an asshole, who doesn't take any shit from anybody. That was the character that people fell in love with. And as soon as they started cheering him, and as soon as we said, okay, you can cheer him now, but now we're going to change him. And it was, a, a, I just fought, and I, I, I lost. I lost big time, but it, it was Vince. They don't, they don't want Kevin Nash. We don't have to change him. We just have to change his opponents. That's all they want. They just want the opponents changed. Let him cheer him. Let him be him. Um, to me, that was the mistake that was made with, with Diesel. And Vince, I think, was overwhelmed and, and liked Kevin Nash and wanted more Kevin Nash in the Diesel character. But the audience wanted their kick-ass Diesel. Let's, uh, let's keep going here. I've always wanted to know... Um... And, and this is from Kent. What does Bruce think about born again wrestlers who were known to be jerks during the bulk of their career? And, you know, I guess we should tread lightly here because if we're not careful, we're going to offend some folks, but I do know that you have an opinion about this. Chat me up. You know, um, look, I think everybody's entitled to their own beliefs and their own opinions and, and what have you. And they may be different than mine. Everybody's entitled to their own own opinions. I think that the proof is in the pudding. I think that when people go out, show me versus tell me. If you're a changed man, then be a changed man. But you know, do handle your business differently than you did before, and prove it to everyone on a daily basis. So there, there was a period, in my opinion, of people, uh, mainly wrestling promoters, that went through a time of everybody was was born again. And what that meant, what was funny to me was nothing that they did in business and in and or in their personal lives would reflect any change whatsoever, nor did they live their life any differently than they had before when they would talk about their sins and all of these other things. But the only thing that would change is when it was convenient, I'm a born-again Christian. That bothered me because you're not nothing's changed. So what is it that you were born again? What's changed? What's different? And there are people that are, uh, 100% truthful and have, have changed. I look at Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels is a different person than what he was in the eighties, nineties, and even early two thousands. He is a different person. Um, and he attributes that to being born again. Again, he, he attributes that to, you know, him finding the Lord, living his life in a different way. But Sean 
lives his life in a different way than he did then. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's he, he actually does it. And I look at someone like Lex Luger, who, you know, I, I wasn't a big fan of Lex. I couldn't wait when I heard that Lex was in the green room at StarCast. I couldn't wait to get to the room to say hello to him. Lex is a different person. Now. No doubt. I mean, you know, we can't, I know that's not what we're here to talk about with Starcast, but you want to talk about somebody who has just wowed everyone. I, I can't tell you how many people came over to me and said this exact phrase, Lex Luger is the nicest human I've ever met. And that is not the case that so many people have heard about him so long ago, right. but you want to talk about a different guy. I mean, young, old, new fans, casual fans, non-fans, Lex Luger is like, you know, in that world, people say the light, Lex Luger is the light, man. And it was, yeah, it was, it was great to see him. He was nice as could be. And I, and I was happy for him. I, I was happy to see his smile on his face, but there's a feeling and the feeling and the vibe I got off of Lex was all right, man, you're in a good place here, dude. And, and you're you're happy with yourself. You're happy with your life. And, and, uh, it wasn't that bitter. Everybody owes me everything guy that I'd known before. Um, look, I'm not born again, but I've changed, <laughs> you know, and how I, and how I look at life and how I look at business myself. So it's, I, I tried to just show that rather than talk about it. Yeah. It's you're just trying to be different. You're a lot less of a dick than you used, used to be. Yeah. I try to be, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it just comes out, but I, I really try to. <laughs> shout out to Dave yeah. Silva. Who's listening. Hey, oh, fuck uh, Dave Silva. you know what? He, that ungrateful son of a bitch, by the way, you know, I think all the things we let him do for us and we let him, I mean, seriously, you let him sleep what an hour and a half this week. Yeah. Every night, whether he needed it or not. See, that's just greedy. And I told him, I said, man, what are you doing? going to bed and then and then you know what one one time i saw him he wanted to eat what yeah actual human food yes does he think i'm made of money i know he he was like he said he goes he says me sir pretty sure i have not eaten all day oh my god said, yeah well that's how he talks to me me sir pretty sure and i said hey man you ate yesterday dude we don't have to feed you every day you know, what's great is I feel like sometimes people don't know that we're fucking around. And so when we're busting Matt Coon's balls and Dave Silva's balls, they no, wait, us. we mean it with Matt Coon. <laughs> <laughs> Make no doubt about it. Folks, folks couldn't care less. Silva. I love is the day is long and he's, he's our boy and he works tirelessly on everything, but I do think he needs to pay us a little more to let him do this. No, I agree. I agree. And I'm sure he sees it that same way because he's using simple contacts and, uh, we're working him so hard. He's found that simple contacts is the most convenient way for him to renew his contact lens prescription. That's but, because we told him all about it and how easy it is. Here's my favorite part of the whole deal. All you need to do to renew your prescription with simple contacts is your current contacts, an internet connection and 10 feet of space. Now the doctor's office is wherever you are, bro. After you take this five minute, simple contact vision test online, it'll be reviewed by a licensed doctor and you'll receive a renewed prescription to reorder your contacts. No more appointments, no more waiting rooms, no more overpaying. Simple contacts has all the brands and types of lenses you're familiar with. So you never have to shop around to find your lenses at the best price. The vision test is only 20 bucks and standard shipping is free. Now, as a reminder, this isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. You still need those occasionally, but man, this is the most convenient way to renew a prescription and reorder your contacts. If your vision hasn't changed, this worked for me. I just did it right on my, uh, my iPhone X boom, done. Good to go. I can't tell you how much time this saved me. I hate having to set an appointment, then drive over there and get my eyes dilated. And then I can't drive back and I'm missing work. I can just take a couple of minutes and I'm knocking it out here. Thanks to simple contacts. And you can too. Yes. It saved me some money, but the amount of time it saved me, saved me a lot more money. And you want to save some money. Well, how's this $20 off your first order of contacts. Just go to simplecontacts.com 
forward slash wrestle or just enter our promo code wrestle at checkout one more time that's simplecontacts.com forward slash wrestle or just enter the code wrestle upon checkout and you're going to get twenty dollars off your first order bruce simple contacts man they've made it easy for dave silva to see the see the light and see the error of his ways he's got to come off some of that moolah if he wants to keep working for free for us that's what i'm talking that's what i'm talking about i, I try and tell him you know the other places man because i haven't seen my children in like four days i said oh, they got face time at, le- at least they have a dad right yeah and their daddy exactly. loves them why don't you facetime them right before you go to bed why is he going to bed I, again i think we've been way too lenient letting him sleep yeah let's work on that Michael Scott Moore wants to know, could Bruce expand on why Andre and Vince had a falling out? I think it was time and, you know, no one ever wants to admit it's time to hang them up. Right. Is in bad shape as Andre was in. I think that there was still a part of him that wanted to perform and Vince loving Andre wanting to keep the let you know keep the myth of Andre the Giant alive and the legend of Andre the Giant alive forever didn't want to put Andre out there less than I mean we did that we we did it long enough to please Andre and and I think I think that was it you know look only those two know but I think that that was the gist of it and Andre went on and said okay well I'm done and he made his last appearance for the NWA on, on TBS. But I think that was the, the germ of it. Let's talk a little bit about the show. J and J show that have a really good question, I guess, probably for both of us, but I'll let you go. How are your families handling the explosion of the show and how it has affected their lives? Well, I think for the most part, my family's just happy that I, I leave town a lot more. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it, uh, my whole life, even before my wife and I got married, before we even dated, she she knew what my lifestyle was. I was on the road all the time. I wasn't home a whole lot. And that's what's made everything work for many, many years. And that's all my kids have ever known. So there was a period there where I was home a lot. And boy, did anybody out there that travels a lot for business, you realize that once you come home, you screw everything up and, uh, they've handled it. Well, I think now we're at a point where I I miss the hell out of them. I I hate being on the road, um, but I love being on the road. So it's, it's a, it's a catch 22 thing, but for the most part, they've handled it. They've handled it great. ABC seven one seven wants to know. Why are you answering it? What do you mean? Well, how's your family handle it? Uh, my person is a little, uh, annoyed that we're so busy. Um, she enjoyed helping with Starcast until Starcast was actually here. And then she was ready for it to be over. But now that it's over, she's like, are you sure you don't want to do it again? Because we learned a lot, but you know, when it comes to like, she's like, Hey, what can we do in November? I want to go here, here. I'm like, we can't do anything in November. I'm gone every single weekend in November. She doesn't like yeah, that's that. not a popular thing. Yeah. That's one thing that is not real popular, which yeah. And then it's like, well, what about the set the weekend after Thanksgiving? We're going to the iron bowl, right? Nope. We're going to North Carolina and there's only seven VIP tickets left. If you want to see Bruce and I go check it out at brucepritchard.com wrestle Cade coming your way. It's our first time being in North Carolina. I'm sure this is going to sell out. There's only a handful of VIP left and we're still months away. So if you have any intention of seeing Bruce and I don't wait and think you can walk up and pick up tickets. The venue is going to sell out. Hurry to brucepritchard.com. But that's not popular in my house when I wanted to go visit my parents, have fun, uh, FaceTime me. Bruce and I are in some random remote part of the world trying to make people laugh with our penis jokes. Yeah. So it's fun. It's an adjustment, but it's fun for me. I enjoy it because I've never gotten to, you know, 
I've never gotten to go to a lot of these places. We're, I mean, we're going to England for goodness sake in, in December. I've never been there. So that's going to be fun. I enjoy it. Uh, ABC 17 wants to know NBA finals. And you probably remember this. Can you talk about the day the nuggets office booked a raw during the finals and then raw had to move to Los Angeles. Yeah, that was just a, I don't think that the folks in Denver had much confidence in their team. (laughs) And that's what you call an old fashioned fuck up. Uh, No doubt. Hey, so let's talk a little bit about, and this has been something that a lot of people have asked, um, who's the easiest and who's the most difficult superstar Bruce has ever worked with. That's from future shocker and easiest is probably going to be easy for you to answer, but most difficult and don't say ultimate warrior, take a stab at each. Well, ultimate warrior was the most difficult, but there, you know, there were, um, God, I think through the years, uh, I'm trying to go back and, and, I always looked at difficulty as a challenge, but then there were just some guys that, that you didn't want to work with. You know, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to work with warrior. There, there were people that were, um, um, that didn't, didn't always get it. Uh, difficult as far as producing Sean Stasiak was difficult because he didn't get it. And it would, instead of trying something on, it was always an argument and it was always, he always had a better way. And even when you would let him try his way, he couldn't perform it. So th- those were frustrating, frustrating times. But just anybody that, that didn't want to try something new on and listen, um, as far as the best, you know, I always got, give me the undertaker. We could go out and, and produce shit all day long because he, he trusted me. I trusted him. He always had good ideas and, and, once a decision was made, he would go out and, and do it to perfection. Love working. I mean, Kurt Angle, good God. Um, all day, every day, because he was just fun. Steve Austin, when, when Steve was injured during that time, and the stuff with Kurt was some of the most fun I've ever had in the business because we could show up and just create as we, as we went along. You know, Brian Gwartz always talks about, well, yeah, Bruce loved it because he was working with Vince. And Vince would show up and go, what are we going to do? And we would just do it. Yes. But there was also a creative freedom there where you didn't have to write down every single word. And you could just come up with freeform ideas. And those were the best. Kurt Angle, without a doubt, one of my favorites. Uh, Undertaker, uh, one of my favorites. I loved working with Dusty, even though that could be a, a chore sometimes. I loved it because I loved to see what was in his head. Uh, Mike wants to know if you two go out to dinner, who picks up the tab? Conrad. (laughs) He's got a lot more money than me folks. It, uh, it, it does crack me up though. The, uh, the comments from JBL in New York city about you and your alligator arms. Oh, I I love that. Yeah. Yeah. He had a good time. Hang on, let that. me get it. Wait, oh, hang on. Oh, you got, it. but uh, you, okay. Oh, he's oh, no, he's got it. Thanks. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now, why but, you, but here's here's the funny thing. You know, in New York, I tried to pick up the tab. I'd already uh, beat you to it. And you'd already beat me to it. Yeah. So. No, listen. It's my, I ain't it's, gonna fight you to spend money. That's my it's my pleasure. Uh, it's Michael, my appreciation. Michael wants to know, was LaParca ever considered as a potential signing? Nope. Here's a no great answer. question. We've never talked about this, but I, I wonder this every time I see it. And I'm glad Andrew asked it. If Vince is in the English commentators ears during a pay-per-view, who is monitoring and feeding lines for the international commentators? Hopefully the international producers, but they don't really feed the lines. The, they get the same, they get the same countdowns in English from uh, the executive producer throughout the show. And they get, they get their direction in English as to what they're going to. And if they have an individual producer that speaks the language, then they'll pretty much steer them in the right direction. But 
I don't I don't know what they do now. That's what that's what we used to do back then. We had someone that spoke French and someone that spoke Spanish, but they they didn't they didn't feed them commentary lines. Michael wants to know, did they ever consider a sister for Kane or the Undertaker? Can you bet? No. No, we really did. Vince wanted somebody that, that could fit into the storyline that you could get money out of and, and actually work and be a part of the storyline and, and realize something from them. Tristan wants to know, Bruce, are you a fan of Botchamania? Nope. Nate wants to know when Bruce smokes his marijuana, does he like, does he like to smoke the flower or is he into dabbing? Does that dab? Is that like the dance move thing? Okay. There's that answer. Uh, JR wants to know why move to Hornswoggle as Vince's son, instead of someone more serious. Well, I just think that in the middle of it, the idea with Hornswoggle was to get to a storyline with fit Finley and make fit a baby face. That was the long-term scenario and, and feeling behind it. It was, and it, and it just was something that didn't work. I think fit is probably one of the best workers ever lace up a pair of boots, but as far as trying to get a character over with him and, and a connection with the audience, it just didn't happen with us, but that was the reason it, it was supposed to turn into a serious deal. <laughs> Here's a fun one for you. Who was battle cat and why did he only have a couple of appearances? There were two battle cats. There was uh, the original battle cat, which was Brady Boone and Brady. But Vince always had this fascination with mighty mouse. He always wanted a, a mighty mouse character. So battle cat was born and Brady Boone was somebody that used to come in and he was an enhancement talent. Uh, really, really good, good, nice kid that, Vince looked at it, so he could be Battle Cat. Um, Battle Cat was born. Also, he used a guy by the name of uh, Bob Bradley. And Bob Bradley was under the gimmick for a little while, and, and Bob was was another one. But I think that Brady Boone was a, a much better Battle Cat than, than Bob was. But uh, that was Vince's fascination with Mighty Mouse. He wanted a Mighty Mouse character. I don't know why, but Vince's fascination with Mighty Mouse has got to be one of the best Vince like quirks of all, does it not? Gotta have mouse. Mm. Make it mighty. Yeah, it, it was it was on you know, that that cartoon character fascination thing that that was again you're you're looking especially in the in the eighties, man. It was it was kids. So you had Hulk Hogan needed the, the antithesis to Hulk Hogan. And that was mighty mouse. That was battle cat. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I don't know. It's one of those sneezing, um, cats have no integrity. Giraffes were pussies. I love mighty mouse. There Giraffes is no sick cats have no integrity. <laughs> It's amazing. Uh, Ian wants to know, can we get an update? Wait, wait, on the... wait, 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 back up. You think cats have integrity? No, I'd love to hear you go ahead and go full Vince mode and explain that to our listeners who maybe have missed Brian's appearances on the live shows. No, goddamn, goddamn cat. I mean, a, a dog, you pet a dog. It comes to you. It's happy to see you when you come in. A cat sits there. Yeah, fuck you. Come here, kid. Come here, pussy. They don't come over. They just sit there. They want you to come to them. Yeah, fuck you. Cats have no integrity. Cats are cats. What good is a cat? Is a cat going to stop a burglar from coming in your house? No. They don't give a shit. They'll watch you get robbed. They ain't going to do shit. They're going to go <laughs> shit in the goddamn box. I love you for that. But I mean, what, seriously, what are they going to do? I mean, a dog comes into your house, Ginger's going to attack. Dog comes in my house, Dodger's going to eat all day long. They're not going to happen, or at least they're going to make enough noise so somebody can come and do something. The cat's going to go run to its fucking litter box and take the shit. Can I just tell you how they much I have no integrity. Can I just tell you how much I love Ginger? Well, Ginger's a good dog. I love Ginger too. I just wanted you to know she is the official something to wrestle dog. No, she's the official female something to wrestle with dog. Dodger is the official something to wrestle with dog. We didn't he's male, he's dominant. Whoa. He's dominant. Yes, male dominant. 
I'm just telling you, we did. Hey, how good was it to see Allison Faye uh, in StarCast? I didn't recognize her at first. She's one of our uh, two percenters. Oh, dude, how about this? She's been she's been down since day one. She might be the yeah. original two percenter, if I'm honest yeah. with you. She was one of the two. Yeah. Well, there you yeah, go. Um, this is a question that, uh, we haven't talked about in a while. Ian wants to know, can we get an update on the status of the Houston wrestling library ownership situation? You addressed this once before sometime last year, probably when we did the Houston show chat me up though. Where is it today? As far as you know, I don't know, but I have no idea. I really and truly don't know what, what the status of, of that is and, and, uh, don't really want to get involved in it. Okay. There you go. Um, if WCW won the Monday night war, what do you think Vince would have wound up doing? Would he have joined WCW or would he have went into a different profession? Well, that was never going to happen. Uh, maybe we would have gone into the tent revival business, but, uh, that, that would have to chalk up to with a never, and you never say never, but never. What's the biggest pop you've ever been in attendance for? Hmm. I tell you, one of the, one of the craziest was being in Montreal after uh, WrestleMania with Hulk, with the WrestleMania in Toronto, with after Hulk and Rock had worked, and, and that sustained. It was like a seventeen minute ovation. That was one of the most incredible things I'd ever seen. They were so happy to see Hulk, and I mean, they just, they they went from peak to peak to peak. They, like, you usually expect a crowd to get, die down a little bit, then you bring them back up. This one got mega loud, and then they got louder, and then they got louder. Um, it was It was absolutely incredible, but that was probably one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Here's and of a, course, anytime brother love came out. Oh yeah. He was over. Yeah. Uh, Mike wants to know why didn't the Wayland mercy gimmick last? I always thought it was awesome. Um, that was just his knees. It, it just, um, Dan's knees were, were given out. His body was given out and Dan couldn't be on the road anymore and, and continue to take bumps. So he was ready to call it quits. And you talk about somebody else that this really turned their life away. What what a success story Spivey is. He's you know gone on. He's had his issues and in, in life at different times, but now he helps people uh, get through drug rehab and uh, just a hell of a guy. Really, really good guy. Lawrence wants to know. I met Conrad Saturday night at All In. What did he think of the show, Bruce? You haven't seen All In all the way yet, have you? I have not. I loved all in, you know, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more, uh, from the main event, but I understand they ran out of satellite time, but I was there for a lot of the show in person and I got to see the rest on fight. And I think it was exactly what the show needed to be. Um, it was as, as well booked as you could do. And Bruce, I think you would have enjoyed this. All the storylines came to a conclusion. All the matches told the story and, you know, you knew sort of what to expect going in if you were a fan of being the elite. And in that regard, I thought it was a bit of a throwback, but obviously we had some new action and some crazy spots from guys like Joey Janela. And of course the, the fun stuff with Joey Ryan, uh, I feel like everybody got their money's worth. And, uh, I do want to mention that, you know, I've got a thousand people to thank for Starcast, and I'm going to put something out where I can acknowledge everybody, but. I couldn't have done it without uh, an incredible group of folks helping make it happen. And I hope everybody had a good time and hopefully it was the first of many. Hopefully these guys continue to do these shows and you know, there's something big like all in coming, I hope. And if there is, <sighs> we'll talk about a star cast too. it damn near like to kill me this time, but, uh, I had fun and hopefully you guys did too. It was a convention run, you know, by fans for fans. There's a group of wrestling friends that I have who are in a group DM on Twitter. And that's where this whole thing came together. It was really just me saying, Hey guys, what if, and together we sharpened that idea into a knife and, um, we took a stab at it and it was fun. And hopefully everybody else had fun too. Nick wants to know Bruce and Conrad, what are your favorite books about pro wrestling? You know, my, my favorite book this year 
is probably, um, man, there's been a bunch the, this year, I guess there's, I got two answers on the one hand. I really enjoyed JR's book because I felt like it gave some insight into Vince McMahon that maybe we haven't gotten otherwise, but from a WCW standpoint, I think that new nitro book is outstanding. Bruce, what's your favorite, most recent wrestling book? Most recent is probably Pat's book, Accepted. I enjoyed that. Um, here, you know what? I'm, I'm going to critique your Nitro book here a little bit. And I haven't read it cover to cover. I read bits and pieces of it. I already know. I already know what you're going to go to. Can I you guess? Know what I'm gonna, you, you know exactly what I'm going to go to because I pointed it out to you. It, it was, they talked about the last Nitro and they talked about being at a, a Club Lavella, which is not where we were. And when you read something as simple as that, that is so easily. You look up and it's everywhere correctly um, that could be easily just researched and they didn't bother to do that. It makes you doubt everything else in it. What I did what I did enjoy from what I read was just going back and, and the executives and, and different people from a different perspective in the current organization that they went to. But those are the little pet peeves that that sometime bother me. Uh, but I enjoyed Pat's recently. Uh, the best, if you want to read a, a good book, old school, everybody down here hates me. Pat Barrett is an old school wrestling book. Talks about being a wrestling heel back in the day in the fifties and uh, really enjoyable. And it's a hell of a story. That's just kind of one off the beaten path that I bet nobody else would say. Mark wants to know any Henry Godwin stories. He's from my hometown. I know we probably won't ever get an entire episode on him, but maybe this is worth a shot. What do you got on Henry O? Big old hog farmer, damn it, from a look, man, he came in and, and he talked about raising hogs and shit and growing up, and Vince looked at him and had a hog farmer and was happy as could be. Tough as the day is long. That was somebody that you talk about strong as an ox the strongest guys in the locker room. You always talk about Kane, obviously Mark Henry, but Mark Canterbury, uh, old Henry O. Godwin was right up there being one of the strongest, baddest son of bitches in that locker room. And he was just a, he was just a good old boy that, uh, made good. His neck got fucked up and cut his career short. But I always thought that maybe without, the, the tag team, Phineas, and, and everything, I thought that Henry probably could have gone a little bit further as a single. And we went with the tag early on. We, we needed something for, for Tex. And it was what it was, man. But uh, just one hell of a good guy. He's, he's, he's one of the good guys in the business. Well, I'll tell you what, you can be one of the good guys in your household. All you need is ageless male max. They've got this patent pending formula. It's going to have an active ingredient that helps you boost your total testosterone. It's going to promote those greater increases in muscle size and twice the reduction in body fat percentage when compared to exercise alone. Plus how about an amazing 64% increase in nitric oxide that could be handy in the gym or in the bedroom. Take your manhood to the max, man, and go ahead and try your first 30-day bottle free. Just pay the shipping and handling. Now, that's not 10 days, not 15 days, a full 30-day supply, and it's free. All you've got to do is text the word SLAM to 797979. That's right. Finally, there's a formula available to us that boosts your total testosterone. Now, as a reminder, and this is a bit of a disclaimer here, if your results with Ageless Male Max are too intense, Please decrease use. Now for your free bottle, just text SLAM. That's S L A M to 797979. That's S L A M to 797979. And remember, message and data rates may apply when you do so. Ken has a fun question here. Did Vince ever get mad after getting ribbed? Ever threaten to fire anyone? No. Vince, Vince could take a joke pretty well, but he, he would always get you back. Except for he that Shane earring back. story, right? What's that? Except for the old Shane earring story. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's gotten everybody back after a while on, that, on those. Through the years, trust me, he's probably 
on the upswing there. Uh, Bill wants to know what are Bruce and Conrad's favorite movies of all time. And how do they compare to Jimmy Hart's famous bar and Tiki Dank? Well, first of all, baby, they got ice cold beer and ice cold cans there at the Tiki deck for Jimmy Hart's Tiki deck. But my favorite movie, um, probably of all time. And I watched it the other night, back to the future. Oh my gosh. All yeah. right. That's yours. Doesn't matter. It does. No, it doesn't matter. Derek wants to know why they want to know about you. Why did WrestleMania 16 in the year 2000 not have a singles match on the entire card? Bro, nobody wants a singles match. Yeah, you'd have to ask Russo that one. I think it was just kind of, you know, there were so many guys, and this happens every WrestleMania where it becomes an effort to get everybody on the on the card. And I think that WrestleMania, I think that a lot of the shows would be so much better. Less is more. Make it special. And not everybody should be on WrestleMania. Joseph wants to know, can you talk about Billionaire Ted's wrestling war room segments? Just curious who came up with the idea and who all was involved. Uh, Vince came up with the idea and David Sahadi, we all were involved. We all, we all pitched ideas and we would literally kind of sit in a war room, no different than the one that we depicted old billionaire Ted in and pitch a lot of different ideas. David Sahadi had a guy that did a great, and it spawned from this guy who did a great Ted Turner impersonation. And that was the guy that we used for billionaire Ted. We just tweaked it a little bit and turned it up. But it was pretty much what what we depicted. <laughs> what we depicted in those was kind of how we came up with them, and that was a, a Vince McMahon shot over the bow. And it was also something to see. I remember uh, Razor and Diesel and those guys saying, "Hey, we're with you. We're with you. We're not going down there." And we said, "Okay, we want you to do this for the billionaire Ted deal." And they when they refused to do it, that's when we knew where they were. Here's a fun one. Ismail wants to know, Bruce, can you name your top three beer drinkers you've seen in your career? Uh, Dick Murdoch, John Cena, and, and um, hmm. I'm on the list, damn it. Well, you want wrestlers, don't you? I think he meant career, but yeah, we'll go wrestlers. Uh, Jericho, Flair, Flair. Austin. Flair, I put Flair up there because Jericho drinks vodka, and but I've 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 watched Jericho just toss him down to two and show no signs whatsoever of being the least bit tipsy. Uh, yeah, I think I think Jericho's got some extra filtration. Yes, he's got some Canadian filtration. Yeah, I don't I don't know what's going on there. He's got like a HEPA filter or something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Cristiano wants to know any stories about Patrice O'Neill's brief time in WWE creative. <laughs> um, Patrice was a funny son of a bitch, man. An unfortunate way too soon, uh, into his life. He was, he was a funny guy, but he, I don't know why they hired him because Patrice wanted to do comedy. Patrice wanted to do what Patrice wanted to do. And that's, that doesn't fit with the culture of, of the WWE because you have got to devote yourself to it 24 seven. And he had, when he had gigs, his gigs were more important to him. And, and I'm, I'm fine with that, but then don't take the job and or don't hire him. Um, it just wasn't a good fit. And finally, <laughs> I think, uh, he made Stephanie fire him like three times. Kevin wants to know, will Bruce be writing a book about his career and his successful venture into podcasting? Well, uh, there, there is a book on, on my career and at least, uh, the first run through the WWE, uh, hopefully that will be out within the next six to eight months. But, uh, then from there, I'm probably going to do the, the firing and the TNA years, and then we'll do the podcast. So I got three books that uh, I'm kind of working on in the process of. Scott wants to know: Is Heartbreaker still open? Yes. 
Jason wants to know who's in the hall of fame that Bruce thinks shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Hmm. You know, really, man, just to, to be there. I think that for the most part, everybody was, was worthy of being in the hall of fame. When you talk about guys like Rick Martell and you say, God, he should be in it right now. Um, on merit, I think that when you look at, see, the different people will go to James Dudley. Oh, he doesn't belong in there. But if people knew what James Dudley, what James Dudley's contribution to the business was, and how he was a part of the old WWWF with Vince McMahon, Vincent uh, J McMahon. He does deserve to be in it. I mean, he was in, he was influential in the early years uh, with Bobo Brazil and just Washington D.C. and the building of that company. So, I, man, I think everybody that's in it, uh, not real crazy sometimes about the celebrity choices, but if you're going to do it, it is what it is. I think Drew Carey is probably the most deserved uh, celebrity in the celebrity wing. Uh, Roman wants to know, and he asked me, but I'll ask you cause you've tried them both big Bob Gibson's or dreamland barbecue. I like dreamland. Uh, big Bob's is the way to go. You're wrong. No, I'm not wrong. Uh, Paul, well, wants none to... of it is Texas. None of it's real barbecue. Like in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Barbecue. As soon as you land here, you want to go straight to a barbecue place. Take a poop with your pants on. No, I like all I like are the wings and the turkey at the place. Yeah. Do you, do you even know the name? I can remember it. Don't look it up at your phone right now. I can't do that because I got this special microphone and it won't let me do anything else on my phone. Paul Whitney wants to know, did Vince have any thoughts on Disco Inferno? No, I don't know that Disco was really ever somebody that was discussed. Uh, contrary to <laughs> what I think Disco believed for a while. I think Disco thought that I, I like put the kibosh on him, but he was never discussed during my time. Jake wants to know who signed Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder and who created the major brothers gimmick. Well, I created the edgeheads and that was, well, I say I created the shit that really created it. They came to us and they looked like edge. They had an idea and they said, Hey, what if we were edgeheads? And I loved the idea and we developed it from there, but it was the two guys that were in developmental didn't have a whole lot for them at the time. And they created a gimmick for themselves. And I thought they did excellent at the edge heads. Here's a fun one. Tony wants to know, does Conrad have a, have a high key small hog? I, I don't understand this reference. <laughs> Eric wants to know what's the worst crowd slash fan incident you've ever observed. Um, well, I was in a riot in Port Arthur, Texas, where they locked us into the dressing room. They turned over a police car and set it on fire. Uh, people came down from the from the rafters, swinging their belts over their heads. And if you've ever been to Port Arthur, Texas, most of them all have these giant fucking belt buckles with hooks on the end of them that hurt when you get hit in the head from six feet away. Um, the, the riots were pretty much the worst. I, I hated I, I love the riots. It was, boy, if you got a riot, that used to be a good thing. Uh, but some of them would get kind of scary when you don't know if you're going to make it out of, a lot, out of it alive or not. I don't know um, that we've ever considered this, but this is a great idea. Kenny wants to know, was Paul Bosch a consideration for the figurehead WWF president at one point, especially around 87? Wouldn't he have been great at that, in your opinion? Paul, yeah, Paul would have been good at that. And, but, you know, they didn't need him. They had Tunney at the time, and Tunney was a pretty good figurehead. But Paul would have, yeah, Paul would have been good at that. Juan wants to Paul. know any crazy Patriot stories. Oh, boy. You know, the, this, is a, this is a funny thing, too. When Del Wilkes came in, he didn't last that long because of his elbow injury and shoulder injuries. He wasn't here long enough to have any good good stories. You know, we got damaged goods when he came in. So it wasn't something that he, he was around a whole lot. And in global, when I was there, I got to work with him one night 
knock him out, take his title, and move on. So um, I think I, as much as we had a relationship through the years, talking about whatever I would want to bring him in, but just never, never got to work with him all that much. Ernesto wants to know when you drink beer, is it always a Miller? Uh, I'm really a Coors Light guy. Not me. I'm a Miller guy. Matthew wants to know if something to wrestle was ever to become a movie, not that that's ever happening. Who would play Bruce and who would play Conrad? All right. I'm going to guess who would play you and I'm going to go fat Val Kilmer. Now who would play me? Um, Dom DeLuise. Isn't he dead? Yeah. So we can prop him up and go, Hey, 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 no, my gosh. I'm thinking like, um, What's the dude who, uh, what's the dude who played Dan Connor on Roseanne? That guy. Uh, John Goodman. Yeah. He, no dude. He's like too all small now. Oh, okay. Jonah Hill when he gets fat again. Jonah Hill when he gets fat again. Yeah. I could grow a beard. Yeah. There you go. All right. Cool. Um, Jamie wants to know, do you think there is a case for having WrestleMania split over two nights instead of one enormous show? I definitely think these events are too long. Last WrestleMania was over six hours, including the pre-show. What say you? No, I I think over two nights, it's just, it's less than, um, it, it just every, it just becomes less than what's the first night. What's the second night. And, And it draws comparisons. I think WrestleMania should be four hours and build to it. And again, not everybody has to be on it. Corey wants to know, since you're down at MLW helping out, what talents have been your favorite to work with? Also, what are your thoughts on Brian Pillman jr? Uh, you know, this is my second time to work with Brian and I haven't seen him in the ring yet. So time will tell, we're going to be able to take a look at him and, uh, you can check him out on BN, but I haven't seen him in the ring and I will see him very shortly. So it's, uh, the jury's still out on Brian Pillman. I'm a big fan of Tom Lawler. I like Pentagon and Phoenix. It's, you know, it's a young, hungry crew. And, and I think that if these guys take seriously the opportunity they have in front of them with the exposure that they have, you know, who knows, it may be MLW in the garden at some point or on down the road, having a big, type of event on pay-per-view so more power to him douglas wants to know have you ever or would you ever consider starting your own independent promotion no to all the above don't want the (laughs) headache matt wants to know hey bruce with starcast in the books could you pitch conrad on a live stream of his wedding exclusively on patreon lord knows i'd pay (laughs) Uh, hey, Conrad. Conrad. Hey, Conrad. Conrad, you there? Hey, hey. Hey. Hey, I got an idea. Listen, you gonna get married. I ain't like it's gonna cost nothing. All right? We just had some cameras. We stream it live. Megan don't need to know. We'll just tell her, hey, it's for the video tape. Put it on that patron, and old Pedro can then pay for your wedding. I like it. Not my deal. Tap me up here. It, this is from Adam. Who would you pick to host the show with Conrad in your absence? Ouch. Um, What, like forever? You want me gone forever? No. Or is this just a one off? I think it, I don't, I don't know. It's a hypothetical. What does it matter? Okay. Um, you know, I enjoyed listening to Sean Mooney this past weekend. What about Sean? I'm going to post to that. If you were going to pick another, if you were going to replace me, who would you look to? Matt Coon? Fuck you. No, you know, that's not true. (laughs) Hey. I already got you replaced, man. <laughs> Dave Silva's just slaving away. Is he dead yet? Mr. Fisher? Have him book another. He did, not look, he did not look too good on Sunday. Have him book okay. another StarCast 2. I think we're nearly there. 
<laughs> Are we going to get him? Then Sarkas 2 or 3 he will be done, and then it will be mine. Heather, uh, back to Shilver now. We're going to Huntsville. <laughs> <laughs> and the Batman all take house to be next to Bruto. Um, Nathan wants to know, what does Jeff Jarrett think of the Jerry Jarrett impression? He thinks it's dead on. He thinks it's excellent. You know, he gets all, he always gets confused whenever I do it around him. He thinks he's talking to his dad. Dustin wants to know, have you ever eaten a quake burger? The hell's a quake burger. (laughs) I love you for that. What Uh, is it? Uh, (laughs) It was when he killed the snake. Oh, the quake burgers. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Just keep eating. I like mine with cheese. Hey, uh, Wayne wants to know who was the hardest star for Vince to deal with. I'm guessing Jesse Ventura. Jesse was up there. <laughs> you know, it, guys like Bob Backlund sometimes could be difficult just because they were set in their ways. They, they were used to Vince's dad. They were used to the old times. And when things started to change, Roddy Piper was somebody Vince had difficulty with. I think there was just a block there that for whatever reason, they, they would clash. This isn't for you, but I've gotten this a lot. So I'm going to answer here. Zach wants to know why wasn't Ric Flair at Starcast? What is a schedule issue, a WWE issue, or something else? Uh, Rick was booked to do Dragon Con in Atlanta last year, and he accepted the booking and then no showed because he was in a coma. So he owed them the date. So I knew when we ran an event that piggybacked all in that was Labor Day weekend, Flair was out. He had already committed from the prior year and owed them a make good. Uh, but, you know, despite the rumor and innuendo, there's no falling out. That'll make more sense. No, what's bullshit? I call bullshit on that. What's the real story, Conrad? <sighs> That's so full of shit. Because I heard that, that it was a conspiracy. Hey, let me ask you this. This is a great question from Adrian. How does Vince get from town to town? Now, a lot of people would say that's silly. But realistically, is he in a bus? Is he driven in a car, a limousine? Does he have a personal driver? Does Vince just drive 300 miles an hour to the next town himself chat me up well it depends usually they got the plane there and they go they get on the plane and go from town to town back in the old days we we drove usually just be myself pat and vince we get in the car and either um vince or pat would drive they never let me drive never understood why (laughs) but uh, that's the way it was back in the old days. And, and from time to time, we, we would have drivers take us in between towns. But now I'm pretty sure they just take the jet and go in between towns. Austin wants to know, were there ever plans to have the four horsemen in the WWE? Nope. Well, let's go ahead and uh, let's wrap it up. We appreciate you guys asking some questions. We've rapid fired over an hour and a half of these for you. And we're going to try to crank out some more for you later this month on Patreon. If you haven't already, check us out over there. You can join the low, just about nine bucks a month at patreon.com forward slash something to wrestle. And of course, we'd love to have you go ahead and like us on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash something to wrestle. You can follow our official Twitter account at Pritchard show. We're also on Instagram at Pritchard show. He is at Bruce Pritchard and I am at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. And we are out of time. And if you'd like to see the Monday Night Wars debate with Bruce and Eric and myself as a moderator, we had a great time doing that last week on Fight. You no longer have to get the entire weekend pass. Now the shows are individually available, a la carte. Easy for me to say. A couple bucks will make it happen for you. And the main event of the entire weekend is the roast of Bruce Pritchard. Uh, Yes, we have some wrestling personalities, but man, we have straight killers. The kings of comedy, if you will. And they're all super fans. So if you enjoy wrestling and you enjoy laughing, you don't want to miss the roast of Bruce Pritchard. You can pick up both of those shows individually over at fight.tv forward slash starcast. Anything we need to hit for you, Bruce, I do think we should remind everybody that we're just, uh, we're counting the days to San Antonio. It feels like this is a show that we've been building towards for a while, but next weekend, man, San Antonio, here we come. 
Exactly, and I'm looking forward to my hometown boys there in San Antonio. Well, hometown because it's Texas, by God. So I'm looking forward to seeing everybody there, and it is going to be an absolute blast. And we're going to have us some fun. And this has been a nice little uh, rest with a little change. Do the show a little bit differently. Take your questions, and I love that. Looking forward to doing the uh, the Pedro. Is someone got something to do with Pedro? He does not, but I tell you what, we do have, uh, something to do with a surprise guest in San Antonio. If you've been on the fence about San Antonio, don't miss it. Go pick up your tickets right now. You've still got plenty of time to enjoy all the pay-per-view action. It's going to be a great time. Make it happen right now. Don't miss this. It's next weekend. BrucePritchard.com, San Antonio. We're coming to see you. See you next week right here on something to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard.